A year ago, I played Persona 1 to see how the franchise started, and to see if it was a hidden gem buried under a pile of treasure. My overall experience ended up being a mixed bag. There were some parts I enjoyed, and there were others I didn't. Despite my complaints, back in 1996, Persona 1 was considered a success. It sold 201,147 copies during its debut week, and would maintain that record until Persona 5 beat it. If we look at the game data library, we can see that Persona 1 beat Virtual Vita 2, Super Bomberman 4, and Crash Bandicoot. Safe to say that Atlas had a new subseries and greenlit a sequel. Well, two I should say, because while writing the story, Tadashi Satomi thought it needed two different perspectives. Thus, Persona 2 Innocent Sin and Eternal Punishment was born. Some of my Persona friends have played these games and claim they hold up to the modern ones. Well, after playing one in the best version possible, I wasn't so sure. But as a fan of the series, it was my unofficial duty to see this through. So grab a snack and join me on my journey through Persona 2 Innocent Sin. Cue the intro. Persona 2 Innocent Sin maintains the same staff from the first game, Koji Okada as producer, Kazumi Kaneko as a designer, and as mentioned before, Tadashi Satomi as the writer. Throughout development, staff had concerns that American audiences might not understand references to Japanese culture, which is what affected the American release of Persona 1. There was also the fact that some of the game's content could be considered controversial. Ultimately, the PS1 version of Innocent Sin was never released outside of Japan, yet Eternal Punishment did. So for 12 years, people outside of Japan never got the first half of the story. Most people speculate that the in-game content was the reason this happened. But Gail Salamanca, a member of Atlas's USA's localization team, thinks that it was due to staff shortages and resources, since most of the team were already working on Eternal Punishment. According to an IGN article back in 2001, there was still a chance that Innocent Sin could be localized, but only if Eternal Punishment was successful in North America. And if we go back to the game data library, we can see that Eternal Punishment sold less than Persona 1 and Innocent Sin. Atlas must have seen this as a definite no and closed the case on localizing it. That is, until the PSP version of Persona 1 released and became an unexpected success. This encouraged Atlas to remake Innocent Sin for the PSP and finally localize it for the US. The remake was directed by Shoji Meguro, but this time the production team was given a higher budget to work with. They did plan on combining the duology into a single game, but they couldn't fit both of them into a single UMD. This will be the version I am playing for this review. I know a lot of Persona 2 fans will say that the PS1 port is better in every way, but this was the only one that was the most accessible for me. I still don't have a PSP, but I do have- Don't space. say it. Don't f***ing say it. We open with our silent protagonists. Normally I like to rename the MCs in my playthrough for fun. Here's a quick list of some of the names I came up with. Yumato Dante, Alex Ishigami, Lloyd Makame, and my favorite, Hideki- 
But the fact that Tatsuya Suo is so important, not only for this game, but for others, convinced me to keep it canon. Also, can we just take a minute to appreciate the graphics of this game? Holy sh**, what an improvement. Environments have more details and don't look empty. Characters are more expressive and can use multiple portraits now. We're no longer stuck in a first person view when walking through dungeons. We can even turn the camera now. It's impressive how good this game looks. Even without comparing it to the first one, I couldn't help but look around the environments and admire the sprite detail. Tatsuya is working on his bike when all of a sudden, a couple of bullies come to pick on him. Okay, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't pick on the guy who has a bike. Out of nowhere, Tatsuya starts to hear voices in his head and oh my god, what is he doing here? Most Persona games take place years after the last one and usually reference them in a fun and cheeky way. But as we go along, you'll see that Innocent Sin brings back a majority of Persona's one cast. Anyways, Hanya's a beloved principal now, for some reason, and we're told to look for Miss Psycho for guidance counseling. Always great to see her, except when she sends you on a wild goose chase. If only the guidance counselor had an office to visit instead of making me walk around the entire campus. Once we find her, she asks every high schooler's favorite questions. What college are you going to? What's your career? Where do you see yourself in five years? Thankfully, Lisa Silverman comes to rescue us, as she's received a note from Akichi Machina, the rival school boss that's holding a girl from our school hostage. So we Scott Pilgrim our way there. I'm not exaggerating, this place looks exactly like Club Rockets. Sadly, no fighting happens. Turns out Akichi's friend Ken wanted to get Tatsuya to join their band, and this girl known as Cozy is completely fine. Lisa takes this opportunity to burn Akichi so badly that he unleashes his persona. This Lisa Philemon returning once again. I know in the last video I pronounced it Philemon, but that was because a lot of YouTubers I was watching pronounced it that way. But now I'm seeing everyone else say Philemon. So for the sake of my sanity, I'm saying Philemon. Otherwise, I'm gonna call him Phil. He warns the party that a great danger will come as rumors are becoming reality. The group wakes up thinking they just had a wild shared dream. But Lisa believes it happened and that the Joker game is somehow tied to this. So we all decide that the right thing to do is to inform the police and nope, they're just gonna play it. Well, I didn't say they were smart kids. The Joker game is kinda like the Persona game, but instead of seeing your future, it's trying to make your dreams come true. The catch is if you don't say your wish in time, then you'll be turned to a lifeless shadow man. And I know what some of you are thinking. Oh my gosh, it's Joker. It's, it's Joker from Persona 5. Nope, not that one. This one's different. Joker appears and sucks the life energy out of Akichi's friends and tries to kill the trio. We attempt to battle him, but like any JRPG, we're too weak to beat him. Joker decides not to kill them, but instead make them suffer for what they did in the past. You took everything from me. I don't even know who you are. So the main reason why we're fighting demons is because Joker keeps sending them, which I guess makes sense, but you'll literally be walking around a school or a club that's filled with people, and then all of a sudden... I guess I gotta give Persona 1 credit for using the apocalypse as a better explanation, because I'm trying to imagine what this looks like from everyone else's perspective. Joker leaves an iris flower, which symbolizes revenge. The game feel guilty to what happened to Akichi's friends and decide to chase after Joker. Cozy recommends that we head to a ramen shop that sells weapons. But of course, that's just a rumor. We're now able to freely explore Sumeru, and this time we're not running into random demons. Thank God. Just like the first game, exploring the city rewards you with hidden backstories for a party member. And let's not forget the Velvet Room, which now allows you to talk to Belladonna, the vocalist of the Velvet Room theme, Nameless, the pianist of the Velvet Room theme, and this demon painter guy, who's probably crashing here until his art career picks up. It's crazy that we've met the people responsible for this iconic theme twice, only for them to disappear in the later games. Don't get me wrong, I prefer meeting the attendants, but where do these guys go? I guess it's some kind of employment ranking system where Igor gets promoted and gets a new office, while the talent stays behind and doesn't receive credit. Like last time, you need to get new cards for new personas. However, the number of cards needed has increased. But don't worry, they're easy to earn and you can get these free cards, which Demon Painter can use to duplicate any other arcana for you. Once again, everyone can switch personas, but throughout the story, each of our characters will get their own specialized personas. 
and finally, the fusion effect has been improved. It went from this, to this. Once we get our weapons, Cozy informs us that a masked figure was seen talking to Principal Hanya. The trio head to Seven Sisters and see the school clock moving. Apparently there's this ghost story involving a teacher who died within the clock tower, warning that the world will end if time is not stopped. There's also this school emblem curse where if you're wearing slash near the emblem, your face will begin to melt. But come on guys, that's just a rumor. It's not like, OH MY GOD! The trio try to find Principal Hanya in his office, but he's nowhere to be found. Suddenly, two ladies by the name of Maya Amano, an energetic journalist, and Yukino Mayazumi, photographer and returning star from Persona 1, enter the scene. After quick introductions, everyone is attacked by demons. The trio jump in to protect the ladies, but Yukino and Maya dispatch the demons with their personas. Once they realize they're all looking for Joker, they agree to team up. I'm so glad to have Yukino back. She was barely used in the first game's main story and was mostly available in the Snow Queen quest, which we all know was a pain in the ass to go through. It's great to see her get a second chance, and she truly shines here. Alright, now that we got the main party, it's time to talk about the gameplay. Combat is similar to the modern Persona games, with some minor differences. The grid system is gone and characters will move to enemies on their own. The gun option is gone, although Maya uses guns as her main attack. And yes, they're real. While she is an adult, I'm not sure I trust her with gun safety. Auto has been dumbed down to two options. Replay, which repeats your last action, or attack, which is just rush mode. This time we get to see what the battle order will be. You can always change it by setting the turn order, which is recommended if you want to use the game's second best mechanic, fusion spells. When you have two or three party members cast a spell in a certain order, it'll create a special attack that deals massive damage to enemies. This move is amazing and offers a wide variety of combos that you will unlock if you have the right personas. The contact system has gotten an upgrade thanks to the new graphics. You actually get to see these characters perform the ridiculous options, and they're funny to watch. Close your eyes. The mechanics of the contact system have also been improved. You can now select two or three party members to help you out. Your options are limited at first, but as the party grows closer, more choices will become available. The demon's emotional state has been slightly tweaked. Angry and scared still work the same way, but eager will get you cards and happy will allow you to establish a pact with a demon. So the next time you meet them, you can get money, items, or ask them for info. That is, if you don't piss them off. You can't earn additional XP via contact like the first game, but I found difficulty to be easier this time around, which I guess leads to the controversy of this port. Some Persona 2 fans will say this version sucks due to the increase of menus, lower difficulty, being slower, and getting rid of exploits people used in the PS1 version. Personally, I never had a problem with the combat. I enjoyed it and would argue that some aspects of this combat system should be carried over to the modern games. I do have some complaints though. I lose track of the characters whenever they're jumping around or end up behind an enemy. I kinda wish they would stay in place. And the enemy encounter rate in dungeons is still absurd. But they're only in dungeons and you can lower the encounter rate with some items. 
Whenever you're outside of dungeons, there's still some shops to make your life easier. We still have Trisha's Springs and Healing Centers, but now you can improve your stats by eating certain foods in restaurants. The effects will only last for a while and will sometimes lead to hilarious situations where party members will say they're hungry at the worst possible times. And hey, no more stupid trees. You can save in the city map now. Gas stations will only sell items. You have to buy weapons and armor at special stores. But those are rare and low in quality. Luckily, there's a solution for this. Rumors have always been a thing in Persona games. If you ever hear one, there's a 90% chance it's true. However, rumors play a major role here. As Philmon stated, rumors are becoming reality. Once you go to the detective agency, you'll be introduced to the rumor system, a mechanic that will affect your playthrough in major ways. That normal looking ramen shop from earlier? Well, if you talk to some rumor mongers, you can take that rumor back to the agency to spread it around, and it'll instantly come true. With the rumor system, you can turn any normal looking shop into a weapons or armor store, and you can determine the quality, price, and resale value of each store depending on the information you have. The more people you talk to, the more options you have on that rumor. This applies to other stuff as well. You can unlock hidden enemies slash dungeons, change the layout of a floor for better gear, and improve your luck on winning prizes. You can also talk to demons you have a pack with to give you information about other demons, and use them to make it true. This is a well designed mechanic. Just when I thought I did everything, I ended up missing out on a dungeon that couldn't give me legendary weapons. But that had a cameo I didn't care about. That's all the features that are available in the PS1 version. But something that was added for the PSP is the Climax Theater. <laughs> this mode has a bunch of long side quests that are non-canon and separate from the story. Two of these have you returned to St. Hermlin High, the school from Persona 1, and the last one takes place in Karagasaka High, the school from Shin Megami Tensei If. Now it may seem strange that there are only three side quests in this mode, thinking that there would be more. Well there is in the Japan ports. There's a bunch of DLC quests that are available in the PSN store. Some of them were collaborations with game magazines, but the other side quests featured the cast of Persona 1 teaming up with the cast of Persona 2 in the style of Persona 4 Arena Ultimax. But that's not the worst part. There was a feature where you could create your own dungeons with fully scriptable events that could be shared with others, all removed due to technical challenges. Overall, the gameplay has been massively improved. But what about the characters? Tatsuya is a much better MC than the first one. Not only do we see why he's friends with everyone, but he has personal stakes within the story. Despite being a silent protagonist, he speaks the most through his actions and is the only one of the MCs to use multiple portraits. I like him so much that I don't see him as a self-insert character. He feels like a real person. Lisa is a combination of Chie and An. She's funny yet brave enough to throw down with anyone. And if you look at Tatsuya the wrong way, she will kill you. She's a native Caucasian who's always dealing with prejudice because of her looks and American heritage. Her dad loves Japan and wants her to become the ideal Japanese girl. But Lisa wants nothing to do with that and that's why she learned how to speak Cantonese. Akichi is one of the best don't judge a book by its cover character. At first glance, I wanted to throw hands with him. He kind of reminded me of that creepy library guy. On the surface, he seems arrogant and narcissistic. But deep down, he has a much lower self-esteem. When he goes to visit his father's sushi shop, his dad scolds him for his attire and makes it clear that he wants Akichi to take over his business someday. Akichi wants to focus on his band Gas Chamber, but he knows his dad won't support it. It's clear that Akichi's dad has inflicted some emotional trauma on him. Maya is integral to the story, but not in a way where she steals the spotlight from Tatsuya. She's able to share it and feel just as important. No matter how bad the situation is or how scary things get, she will always put others before herself. She's like the big sister of the group. I can see why she's the protagonist for the next game. Is that a spoiler? That game is like 24 years old and I knew that before playing this one. Yukino has matured since last time and knows how to handle herself in a fight. Despite not being closely tied to the plot like the other four, she feels integral to the team. Everyone in the party is great and I didn't tell you everything about them. But that's for later. Let's talk about some of the side characters. Cozy is a great example of how mature the writing has become. In Persona 1, Toro was a heavyset character who was used for cheap fat jokes. 
and a lot of horrible things happen to him. Thankfully, Cozy is treated infinitely better. Instead of saying she likes eating food, she's involved with the school newspaper, investigating legends and curses. Not only does she help the gang in the first act, but she's tied to one of the party members. There are still fat jokes here, but characters directly say they're wrong to make and will defend her. It's a great example of how to avoid writing offensive stereotypes. And even Toro is doing better now. Tamaki returns, this time being more prominent than just a cameo. I don't think I mentioned this last time, but she was the female protagonist in Shin Megami Tensei If. She was in Persona 1 and can give you the weapon she used from her game, but I missed out on that because I did the Snow Queen quest. Now she's a part-time worker at the detective agency and still dating Tadashi for some reason. Miss Ideal is Lisa's homeroom slash history teacher who, let's say is fascinated by conspiracy theories. She plays a huge part of the story, so we'll get back to her later. And I guess I should talk about him since he is a villain, but I don't want to reveal everything yet, so let's just talk about Joker on a surface level. He's a far better villain than Kondori, not just from looks, but also in motivation. He may run from the group as frequently as Kondori did, but he always leaves a memento to keep them guessing. He's an intimidating figure and considered one of the best Persona villains. Last but not least, we gotta talk about the music. The music for the port was remixed by Toshiki Konishi, Ryota Kazuka, and Asushi Kotajo. The reason for this was because Shoji Maguro was handling the music for Catherine. Due to the player feedback about how the music for the Persona 1 port was handled, the team included the option to switch between the original and new versions. Fun fact, the new opening Unbreakable Tie was written by Japanese hip-hop artist Lotus Juice, who's been a longtime contributor to the franchise and sung by J-pop singer Asami Izawa. And to no one's surprise, the music is amazing. Maya comes up with the solution to destroy the school emblems in order to stop the curse. Along the way, Ikichi hears about this Miyabi Hanaku, who was his girlfriend back in grade school. Lisa secretly reveals to us that Miyabi is actually cozy, but doesn't tell Ikichi. After committing school vandalism and seeing a walking statue, the gang realize they need to break the clock tower. I love whenever you're about to fight a boss, the game warns you with this ominous sound. Inside we see the ghost teacher, warning us of the world's end, giving the gang a feeling of deja vu. Hanya steps out, revealing he's teamed up with Joker to become the most beloved dictator, I mean principal. Sorry, it's hard to tell the difference. Joker calls Tatsuya D for stealing his dreams, and disappears like Tuxedo Mask. Hanya steps down, and we have our first boss fight. I never thought we would be fighting this rando from the first game, while standing on a giant gear with a giant wrench. Believe me when I say this game will only get crazier. After defeating Hanya and breaking the clock tower, he decides to yeet himself out the frickin' window. This man was willing to persona himself. We can actually choose if he lived or died from this, and this will affect something down the line. Anyways, Tuxedo Joker left a white Achillea, which symbolizes war slash battle, causing Maya to feel sympathy for Joker, along with a strange sense of familiarity. As we head off to find Miyabi, we hear a rumor that there's a casino at Mu. Of course, we can't let any distractions get in our way. Oh my god, look at this place. Alright, let's just start small and see what happens. Three of a kind, baby, let's go! Come on, seven! Give me a lucky seven! I need more coins, man, just one more! Oh, come on, he cheated! Alright, if we all play together, maybe we'll- Fuck! Alright, just one more time of cards. I mean, it's not like I'll win. Royal Flush! Yeah! I lost everything. One of the rumor mongers, Shikaren, informs us that Miyabi infiltrated the Zodiac Club to find the Kusai student who was responsible for spreading the album curse rumor. Ikichi doesn't believe this since he's the boss and didn't order his guys to do it. As we enter the club, we run into Seven Sisters, former track star, Anna Yashukaza, who dropped out due to an injury and hasn't been making good choices since. 
Yukino sees Anna as her once young and foolish self and tries to help her, but Anna blows her off and walks away. One of the Kasai students says that another student by the name of Hiroki not only made the rumor, but has taken over as the new leader and has Miyabi. Along the way, we'll see that some of the students are wearing masks, which is required for this gathering that's happening later. I'm sure it's just a masquerade party. These guys don't seem like, nope, never mind, it's a cult. Hiroki reveals that Kozi is Miyabi, who was too embarrassed to tell Akichi. Despite his earlier comments, Akichi still cares about her, which causes Hiroki to slash her cheek and have his goons dogpile Akichi. Like the first game, we're given a choice to either help a party member or let them resolve it themselves. No matter what choice you make, it won't affect the ending. However, you'll want to make the party handle it themselves because this will give them character moments that will strengthen their personas later in the game. By letting Kichi handle it, he beats Hiroki with words and gives up his boss title. Even though he won, Akichi admits he has no right to act all high and mighty after all he's done as well. Akichi tries to comfort Miyabi, but she runs away. Yukino basically threatens a child for info, but hey, I think we already crossed a lot of lines today. And it turns out Hiroki spread the rumor on behalf of the student council president, Yasuo. He also reveals that once Joker grants your wish, you need to join an organization. The same one that's having a gathering later and that one of their executives named Lady Scorpo will be there. The group heads to Cuss High where students are preparing for the upcoming school festival. While investigating, they hear that Yasuo is hiding in the basement, which allegedly has an old air raid shelter. Once they get there, Akichi and Lisa hear him and rush to corner him. But it turns out to be a trap. They're now stuck in the aforementioned air raid shelter, with no supposed exit. Yasuo gloats behind a walkie like the incel he is, which causes Akichi to break it. So with no contact to the outside world, the gang try looking for an exit. After searching for god knows how long, Maya figures that someone got out using a mirror. Akichi is the only one that has one, but he and Lisa fight over it and end up breaking it. With no exit in sight, the group decides to get some much needed rest. We have a moment with Maya as she tries to remain positive. She pulls out this stuffed bunny called Mr. Bun Bun, a good luck charm slash coping mechanism for her during tough times. She still believes that Joker isn't as evil as he seems, sensing a childlike innocence to him. Tatsuya shows her his good luck charm, the lighter he always pulls out. This brings up a memory from his childhood when a close friend gave it to him, both trading shared valuables passed down from their fathers. They also run into this random drunk guy, who I'm sure won't be important down the line. The gang figures that Yukino's camera can create an exit and the group escape. Unfortunately, they were in there for a while as the school festival is now open and the mass gathering is happening now. They rush inside to find Yasuo sucking the life energy out of everyone into a skull, like a true Sailor Moon villain. The gang chases him up to a roof and we have our second boss fight, which only lasted six minutes. Longer than I thought he would. That's what she said! He reveals that the organization is called the Mass Circle, and anyone who wants to join needs to steal ideal energy derived from Dreaming Hearts. Akichi and Lisa are shocked by the name because it's a kid's game from their dreams. Lady Scorpo makes her appearance, with Yukino realizing it's Anna, as she informs the group that the skulls can be controlled by someone bearing the constellation of the Holy Cross, Yasuo is burned to death by King Leo another executive of the mass circle with a grudge against Maya and may or may not be crazy. Leo and Scorpio leave the school and we see Maya in distraught due to her fear of fire. The group checks on everyone back at the party only to see that all of them turn to shadow men. Maya suggests they go out and find any news on Joker. As the group leaves, Yukino vows to save Anna. When the group stops by the park, a swarm of fans congratulate Lisa for her idol debut even though she didn't have one to begin with. There's a new rumor going around that she's the third member of this new idol group, Muses, who will be filming a video at Moo. After fighting off my gambling addiction, Lisa finds out her two friends are part of this, as they wish for all of them to become idols. Lisa wants nothing to do with this, but Maya points out that the mass circle could be involved. They make their way to the studio where this slime producer named Jinji introduces the world to Muses. They're expected to perform at the concert hall in Aoba, with Lisa singing a part of the song in English. Maya detects that Jinji is a Persona user, which prompts the group to sneak into the show. 
After a tedious park dungeon and bribing a couple of security guards, they make it backstage where they overhear Lisa, frustrated at being stereotyped once again as she doesn't know English. Her friend suggests that she makes a wish to learn English, but Lisa refuses. Genji will try to convince her to join, and Akichi wants us to intervene. Trusting her decision, the group watches Lisa perform on stage. If only this game got a dancing sequel. After her solo, Lisa proudly states how she's not who people see her as, and it's okay to be true to yourself. But the gang discovered there are bombs planted in the concert, and Lisa warns everyone to evacuate. Jinji appears as Prince Taurus, as well as King Leo, who's disappointed that the song didn't steal the audience's life energy. Man, this really is Sailor Moon. King Leo escapes, leaving us a riddle to find him, but first we have to fight Jinji in our third boss battle. Although he loses, he decides to suck the girls, steal the life energy from the rest of Muses, leaving a traumatized Lisa. The group barely escape as the concert hall explodes, once again scaring Maya, with Yukino seeing her hands burned. Miss Ideal appears and recognizes the flames as another event in the Oracle of Maya. When Maya tries to question her, she accuses Lisa of being a spy for the Fuhrer and runs off. Yukino decides to call a friend to help figure out the Zodiac Riddle. We see the return of Ellie, who helps us figure out King Leo's next targets, which leads us to Smile Hirasaki and Gold. Smile Hirasaki is a dungeon where you have to go through every floor to find your friends. And there's this annoying fire alarm ringing the entire time! The frustrating part is that the transmitter we were looking for was back in the same bathroom we started at. This leads to a boss fight with the toilet demon Belphegor and Ixquick, another mass circle member who believes herself to be a reincarnated warrior. By the way, the background of this boss fight is just a bunch of floating toilets. I did not install any mods. This is a genuine background that was used in the original version of the game. The Gold Dungeon also reuses this formula of starting and ending in the same room. But it has a better structure as the transmitter is somewhere else and we have to chase this guy back to the starting room. We also get to meet Ulala, Maya's roommate who not only finds a bomb but is also a Persona user. We don't really get enough screen time with her as she leaves and doesn't make another physical appearance for the rest of the story. With the last riddle, well, not really, it just tells him the answer. The group heads to the Aerospace Museum where they run into Tadashi and Tamaki, who are... part of the Black Cat Pirates? Tadashi accuses us of being spies for Fuhrer thanks to Miss Ideal. Suddenly, King Leo appears, blocking the exit with fire and trapping not only the group, but every child that was there on the field trip inside. Maya is once again panicking, but pushes through in order to save the children. This leads to a tense sequence where we must look through each room to find the trapped children within the time limit. During this, we find Ixquick trapped on a suspended plane above a pit of fire. By letting Maya go, she set aside her fears and saves Ixquick. But as she tries to climb back up, the rope snaps and Maya falls back into the fire. Tatsuya reaches out to save her, unlocking a hidden memory where a young girl was trapped in a burning shrine thanks to an insane pyromaniac. Young Tatsuya was beaten and stabbed, but he managed to burn the insane man. With everyone accounted for, the group makes their way up to the roof to find King Leo battling the Black Cat Pirates. Ixquick tries to reason with him, but he holds her hostage and reveals his true identity as Tatsuya Sudu. I'm still calling him King Leo for the video. King Leo activates his backup transmitters and blows up Smile Hirasaka and Gold. A pissed off Maya asks what Joker's endgame is, and King Leo says the fulfillment of the Oracle of Maya, to supplement mankind to the Idealans. From that day forth, the new race will be close to gods. Okay. The floor collapses under King Leo, and Maya saves Ixquick once again. Luckily, there's a rumor about the observatory restaurant being a working blimp, so the group escaped danger in an epic fashion. <laughs> Thank you.
Everyone tries to evacuate the blimp, but King Leo returns as our fifth boss. Other than somewhat sharing our name, hearing voices, and using a dark version of Tatsuya's persona, we don't get any more information about him for the rest of the game. With no choice, the group takes the kids and jumps out of the crashing blimp, making it safely to a nearby beach. Ix quick realizes she's not cut out for this and goes to become a manga artist. Good luck with that career choice. God knows it's a tough one. Yulala calls to inform the group that they're being blamed for the bombings and rumored to be terrorists. Luckily, Maya pulls a reverse card and gets the kids to spread a rumor of how heroic they are. The gang decide to split up and meet back at the detective agency. Along the way, we'll see more of the buildings that were bombed. Those being the fire department and the police station where Tatsuya's brother works at. Oh yeah, Tatsuya has a brother. Did I forget to mention that? Citizens are scared and the rumor mongers have run out of rumors to spread. Things are looking dire for Sumeru. Everyone makes it back to the agency, although Maya arrives late and acts a bit weird. A news broadcast reveals that there's another rumor where the last battalion and Fueller are searching through ancient ruins hidden around the city. This ticks Miss Ideal and she goes on a full rant about everything. Some of you are probably just as confused as well. So I'm going to try my best to explain everything Miss Ideal said after 3 hours of googling. The Mayans, which the game spells with an I, but let's assume it's the one with a Y, are an ancient civilization that were pretty advanced for their time. They built cities and were the first citizens to use zero and develop written languages. Their way of thinking was so advanced that some people believed that they had help from aliens. One of their traditions is a greeting from the law of Inlakea Akin, which in modern interpretation means I am another yourself. But in traditional Maya interpretation, it means I am you and you are me. In Maya mythology, there is an underworld called Sibalba, which translates to place of fright. And according to Mayan cosmology, it's ruled by nine gods called the Balantaku. According to the study of ufology, there are these ancient extraterrestrials from another star system called the Palladians believing that their goal is to help Earth through its difficult transition from the third dimension to the fourth dimension, and to assist each of us in our personal endeavors of awakening, remembering, and knowing. Then there's the last battalion, which is a secret group of Nazis hidden somewhere in the world, waiting for further orders. Miss Ideal believes that the Oracle of Maya is a prophecy left by the Pleiades aliens. She believes that underneath Sumeru is the ship Sabalba, but due to an intergalactic civil war with the Bolantaku aliens, they have controlled the ship. Miss Ideal figures that the last battalion helped Fuhrer escape long ago, who now possess cutting edge technology and a relic that absorbed Christ's blood. The Mass Circle and Last Battalion want Sabalba so badly because once the prophecy is fulfilled, humans will turn to idealins, which is a transhuman state where they understand the true meaning of life. But only a few humans will get this. The rest of humanity will be wiped out. This is all from a book written by her, Ms. Akashihara, and Sudu, which has been leaked like a Harry Potter book. So now all the rumors will come true. Lisa, rightfully, does not buy any of this since the mass circle was a childhood game in her dreams but she starts to realize that it's not a dream, but a forgotten memory. Upon further questioning, we learn that Ms. Akashihari was a world history teacher at Seven Sisters, who was always concerned that the history he was teaching was false. What kind of f***ing background check does this school do? While working on the book, he believes someone was watching him, which may have led to his infamous death, as he was the one who died in the school clock tower which Miss Ideal thinks was caused by the last battalion. She gives Tatsuya the book and begs us to stop the prophecy from being fulfilled. The group heads to the Aaliyah Shrine to get some much needed answers. That was a lot of info and I think we should take a little break from the story. So let's talk about something I didn't know this game had, which is voice acting. Persona 1 did have this, except it only happened in cutscenes which were added for the PSP port. The PS1 port had one or two if I remember. The original release of Innocent Sin only had Japanese voice actors since it wasn't localized, which Atlas decided to remaster instead of re-recording. So these are the same Japanese voice actors from 1999. The English voice actors were added in with the PSP port, 
Now I know some of you will say that the voice acting here doesn't really matter because characters will only talk in battle and rarely in cutscenes. But I think it's cool that we got voices for these characters in the first place. It gives me a better understanding of their personalities. I connect more to these characters by hearing them instead of reading their texts. In a time where companies are tempted to use AI as a means of saving money, it's important to remember why we have voice actors in the first place. They bring life and give identity to these characters we love. Persona wouldn't be as popular as it is today if it wasn't for the voice actors who poured their heart and soul into the characters. So I want to take this time and give these actors the credit they deserve. Tatsuya Suo is voiced by Keith Silverstein, who voiced a couple of characters in Shin Megami Tensei 5, Dalsum in Street Fighter 6, and Shido in Persona 5. For Japan, it was Takahiro Koizu, who played Peacemaker in Suicide Squad Isekai, Seek Jaeger in Attack on Titans, and Shiragani's dad in Love is War. Akichi Mishina is voiced by Troy Baker of all people. I guess it shouldn't come as a surprise since he plays Kanji from Persona 4. I also found out he voiced Nanjo in the PSP port. That's cool. Still hate that character. I don't need to go over his work since we already know it, but I will brag about getting to meet him at my local Comic Con. For Japan, it was Kosuko Toyomi, who's the Japanese voice for Junpei in every single game. Lisa Silverman is voiced by Stephanie She, who played Isaki a couple times, and Misuha Maimizu in Your Name. For Japan, it was Hiroko Konishi, who voiced Bridget in Guilty Gear XX, did I say that right? Lilith in Darkstalker 3, and Roll in Mega Man 8. Maya Amano is voiced by Peggy O'Neill, who played those two creepy old ladies in Catherine Full Body, a couple of characters in Digimon Frontier, and a wedding dress orc from Power Rangers Wild Force. For Japan, it was Aki Yuichi, who's dubbed a lot of popular western characters, and Spyro for two games. Yukino Maizumi is voiced by Kirsten Potter, who played Tai Takami in Persona 5, a lot of women from Catherine, and played Yukino in the PSP port of Persona 1. For Japan, it was Tomo Hamba, who's dubbed Fiona, Lilo in that Stitch anime, did anyone watch that? And Velma on a couple of occasions. She was also Yukino in the original Japanese PS1 port. King Leo is voiced by Ryusi Nako, who mainly voices Frieza. Jinji Siaki is voiced by Sho Hiyami, who mainly voices Salsa. Anna Yashisaka is voiced by Kamiko Watanabe, who plays Akimi Aisa in Tomochan as a girl and Mini Bueno from One Piece. Principal Hanya is voiced by Takashi Nakasako, freaking Donkey Kong himself. Hiroki Tsukamoto is voiced by Yashihara Yamada, mostly known for voicing Chuck Keith in Super Robot Wars and was one of the original Dalsum from Street Fighter Alpha 2 to Capcom vs SNK 2. By the way, can you believe those are coming back? Yasuo Inno is voiced by Junji Kitajima, who plays Arbio Pinadin from Super Robot Wars. Kenkichi Mashina was voiced by Iji Mariyama, who played a lot of old man roles, but he did a great job. R.I.P. Akashi Hoshi is voiced by Hikari Tachibana, who played Tetra and Zelda in a couple of games, and Naomi in that sh voice activated horror game the Spear Hunter talked about. Fuhrer is voiced by David Lodge, who was Igor in Persona 5. Wow, talk about an upgrade. Imagine having voice Hitler in your resume. And I can't say the character names because I'll spoil the plot, but I'll still put their pictures up. Bryce Papenbrook, who voiced Meliodas from Seven Deadly Sins, and Aaron Yeager from Attack on Titans. For Japan, it's Shiguru Shibuya, who's known for playing Pegas... Pega Salta e Claire, what the f kind of name is that? Patrick Seitz, who voiced Keith Shites in Attack on Titans, Jiren from Dragon Ball Z, and President Takana in Persona 3 Reload. For Japan, it's Jin Yamanoi, who voices Rolento, Nanjo in the PS1 port, and dubbed Ghostface in four screen movies. Mika Doi, who's Kobe from One Piece, and is Japan's Alice and Daisy Duck. She's been doing this since 1953. I did not expect this many talented voice actors, but that just goes to show how amazing they are. Now let's get back to the group. At the shrine, Misa recalls a story of there being a fire and a trapped girl who tragically died inside. A butterfly appears and we're once again summoned by Philemon, who says we're ready to face our past and need to head to the Aaliyah Cavern. Within the cavern, they learn that 10 years ago, the gang met during a summer festival as children, wearing Fetterman masks which are legally distinct Power Rangers and a long-going reference for the series. 
The children grow fond of each other and decide to meet regularly at the shrine while wearing these masks, calling themselves the Mass Circle. One day, they run into a young girl praying at the shrine. The kids invite her to join the Mass Circle, and she in turn shows them the Persona game. The kids would call her Big Sis as she was the oldest and always looking after them, until one day she announced that she was moving away. Young Lisa comes up with the idea to lock her in the shrine until tomorrow. Young Tatsuya ejects, and they both get locked into the shrine, which we now know led to King Leo burning it down. Afterwards, the kids felt so guilty that they locked their masks inside the cavern and disbanded the mass circle. They tried to regress the memory so much that they completely forgot about it, thinking that it was just a dream. Lisa had her dad call the cops to check for Big Sis, but they never found the body, which leads to her theory that Big Sis survived and is now Joker. Then out of nowhere, if you were completely blind and didn't figure this out the first 5 minutes, Maya reveals herself as the imposter and tries to kill the group. But the real Maya jumps in, protecting the group once more, like the big sis she always was. Joker calls an emergency meeting and admits that his plan to traumatically scar them is ruined and offers them a chance to leave with their lives. Maya then reveals that Joker is June, Tatsuya's longtime friend from the very beginning. She tries to calm June down, but he refuses to believe that Maya is Big Sis and votes himself out. After beating Shadow Maya, the group apologize for causing so much trouble and forgetting about her, but Maya doesn't mind one bit and is just happy to see them. The group finds a Salvina flower, which means thinking of you. Little Force Ghost Maya tells everyone that June is suffering from false memories and only they can save him. Philemon congratulates the group and upgrades their main personas to prime status. Except for Yukino because f*** her I guess. The group heads outside and... What is happening anymore? Miss Ideal calls to inform the group where Joker and the last battalion will be, urging the group to hurry before the rings of time start. Otherwise, it'll destroy the world. Safe to say that sh** has hit the fan. There are Nazis with freaking mobile Gundam suits. But hey, we're just innocent children. It's not like- <laughs> Yukino learns that Shunsuke, her mentor slash crush, is taking pictures of the action. We battle one of the Longinus which is a pretty tough fight because they use a knockoff Spear of Destiny that conceals one persona temporarily. Eventually we find Shunsuke, but it's too late as he's been fatally wounded. He's proud to have captured their epic battle and urges Yukino to follow her dreams as he dies in her arms. This is enough to break her, which leads us to these two options. It may not seem like it, but don't pick this one, or things will just end tragically for her. Tatsuya convinces her to keep moving, and Philemon finally decides to upgrade her persona. Jesus man, could you have picked a worse time? She's still grieving over here! After going through a long series of these TSA conveyor belts, the team find Anna in danger and save her from Nazi robots. Anna is still confused on why they care, but Yukina reminds her that she made a promise to save her from the darkness within her. Suddenly, Shadow Yukino appears and tries to stop the group. Yukino, being the badass she is, tells the gang to go without her. The group finally arrives at the heart of the Caracal and sees Joker, shadow versions of them, Queen Aquarius, and Fuhrer himself. So this is allegedly why the game was never released outside Japan back in 99. As you notice, the PSP port replaced all the Nazi symbols with the Iron Cross. And Hitler is now called Fuhrer and wears sunglasses. While Nazis are a major subject of censorship, and probably got this video demonetized, I don't think this was the main reason. There were plenty of games with Nazis before 1999. Castle Wolfenstein, Medal of Honor, and Bionic Commando, which in Japan was called Hitler's Resurrection Top Secret. I guess I could see why they would censor him in 2011. The game was rated T, 
But it just brings attention to this already weird scenario where Hitler has a robot army and wants to kill children. We can talk about unnecessary censorship all day. But this video is already long enough. I don't know if I had to bleep out all the times I said Nazi. So for the rest of the video, let's say Fuhrer and the last battalion. Joker uses the skulls to raise Sabalba. And we see Sumeru rising into space as buildings are destroyed and replaced with temples. Thousands, probably millions of people are dead from this. Battalion robots charge towards Joker, but Queen Aquarius pushes him out of the way, taking the blow. The battalion robots steal a few of the crystal skulls, and Fueller freaking flies away. Joker sends his shadows after the skulls, but starts having a mental breakdown. The group tries to calm him down, but an unknown voice compels him to fight his friends. Joker's boss fight is tough. Not that one, again, this one. In his first phase, he will throw endless amounts of ailments towards you. Hope you've been stocking up on those antidotes. But in his second phase, Joker turns into this weird angel monster. And once again, we fight in this weird background. Why didn't you just reuse the last one? The party manages to beat Joker, who in turn reverts back to June. Out of nowhere, this guy claiming to be June's father demands he returns to the mass circle. Now pure hearted, June refuses, which means this guy will carry on as the new leader. As he leaves, Philemon pulls the group from the collapsing caracal. Philemon starts spouting end of the world jibber jabber, and Maya rightfully points out that we still don't know why all this is happening in the first place. But Philemon says not to worry, all in due time. You know, you are the worst. Yukino decides to give her persona summoning ability to June, stating that she doesn't need it anymore now that she's faced her shadow. Yukino and Anna set off to protect the civilians, which means June is now the fifth party member going forth. Everyone now gets their ultimate personas and prepares to make their way to Sabalba. But before we go to Sabalba, we have some side quests to do. I know that sounds like a drag considering all the times this happened in Persona 1, but thankfully it's manageable here. Each temple is based on an element, and each element is dependent on the other. If one temple goes down, another is affected, thus making the boss fights easier. Going to each temple means you fight a party member's shadow, kinda like Persona 4 in a way. The tourist temple houses Lisa's shadow, who wastes no time on spilling Lisa's darkest secrets to the group, like swindling money from old men, experimenting with drugs, and wanting Tatsuya for his popularity. Lisa doesn't deny any of this and accepts the possibility of Tatsuya not liking her back. You have the option to say you do or don't, but no matter what, Lisa will understand and love him. It's so rare to see growth for these one-sided crush characters, so I applaud the game for doing that. The Aquarius Temple doesn't have a shadow boss, but they do have this weird fish that shoots It may not offer a lot, but it does show June facing the consequences of his actions as Joker. The Leo Temple houses Tatsuya's shadow, and in my opinion, this is the best version of an MC versus their shadow. Because in Persona 1, it was the only character building the MC had. Persona's 4 MC never got to face his shadow. Okay, I know he did in the anime, manga, and fighting game, but we're counting main entries. Persona's 3 MC, well, if you play the game, then you know. And while Joker fighting Shadow Joker in Persona 5 Strikers is cool and all, it's not character building, it's just a boss fight. Here you actually get to talk to Tatsuya's shadow, and he really goes to town with you, remarking on chasing wordless dreams, trying to keep it without a steady job, and what steps you've taken to achieve it. Stuff that's great to hear when you just graduated college. The Scorpio Temple houses Akichi's shadow, and it's definitely the best out of the four temples. For context, Akichi was a shy and chubby child, but was friends with one of the most popular girls in school. This caused the other kids to pick on him, because children are cruel, which led to him developing an eating disorder. Miyabi felt bad for him, so she actually gained weight to support him. But at that point, he changed his personality, and she was too shy to tell him. Miyabi struck a deal with the mass circle to lose weight for Ikichi, but his shadow has taken her for himself. After Ikichi beats and accepts his shadow, he proclaims his love for Miyabi, not for her looks, but for who she really is. The writing for Akichi and Miyabi is phenomenal and was way ahead of its time. 
I think Akechi might be up there as one of my favorite Persona characters. Once we finish all the temples, Maya gets a phone call from Tamaki that Miss Ideal was taken by the Mass Circle for a sacrifice. June reveals that Miss Ideal's full name is Maya Okamura, and his father plans to kill her to fulfill the prophecy, stating that she has Mayan blood and is the Mayan maiden. Wasting no time, the group heads off to Heaven's Gate back at Seven Sisters. When we get to the school, we see that the last battalion has taken over. If you pick the option where Principal Hanya lives, he actually helps the students defend the school. The Narada Stone, set up back at the beginning of the game, takes us to the Silver River. We see a boat and of course Maya offers to drive. But after nearly dying, the group lets Tatsuya take over. We carefully guide the party through the harsh rivers, until we come across a waterfall. Don't tell me, we're about to go over a huge waterfall. Yep. Sharp rocks at the bottom? Most likely. Bring it on. The group survives and somehow makes it to Zabalba. Zabalba is the last dungeon, which means it's the hardest one in the game. You have to go through 8 floors and the enemy encounter rate is higher than ever. It's a long and tedious dungeon. I know there's a reason why in the story, but god we could use a safe room or two. Thankfully the developers realized this and made a portal that will allow you to return to Sumeru for resupplies. And you'll get access to Trisha's spring and the velvet room within the dungeon. As we journey through, the group goes through trauma one after another. We see Jinji's charred body, Jun relives memories of how he was ashamed of his father and having a neglectful mother, which collides with his vague memories and starts to have a mental breakdown. Maya sees a vision of her dad before he leaves for work, which was the last time she saw him, causing her to break down as well. Akichi and Jun conjure dark representations of their parental figures and have to fight them and Lisa starts to lose it as every room they've gone through feels the same. This is why I give the dungeon a little slack for its design, because it was made with the intent to break us and the party as they go on. Maya concludes that this dungeon will respond to thoughts, so by the power of manifestation, they find Okamura in a room full of aliens, who at this point has fallen far off the edge of her flat earth. June comes to the realization that his current father is fake and tries to tell her that all this was manifested by the work of his real father, Miss Kashihara. But Okamura doesn't care and starts blaming June's mom for holding Kashihara back. Suddenly the aliens awaken and b slaps Okamura. So now we have to fight aliens. I know they're fake, but this is still ridiculous. After beating the aliens, the group finally makes it to the heart of Zabalba which looks very familiar. Fuhrer descends, wielding the Spear of Destiny. It's a formidable battle since Fuhrer can use the spear to lock our personas, and we have to use the spirit rib that only has a 50% success rate. After finally beating him, Fuhrer reveals himself to be the fake Kashihara. Part of me is relieved that it wasn't actually Hitler, but it still boggles my mind. Do you know how evil you have to be to proudly wear the skin of Adolf Hitler? Not only do we learn that space isn't real and this is where everything is born, but fake Kashihara manipulated June for 10 years and caused all of the events that have happened throughout the game. All those conspiracy theories, June's trauma, the death of at least a million people was all his doing. And just when you think this guy couldn't possibly be more evil, he summons June's long dead father and his mother who was the lady that was wounded back at the caracal, and murders them in front of him. And thus we enter the final boss battle. Fate Kashihara turns into a monster mash of all the party's father figures, essentially creating the ultimate daddy issue monster. This is a tough fight, and I'm not kidding you, it took me 50 minutes to beat this guy. Upon winning, Philemon appears and reveals it's Nero Lotep, who was Kendori's persona and also engineered the events of that game as well. But that's not all folks. Here's the real blockbuster. Brace yourselves, you might want to sit out. Nero Lotep reveals that he and Philemon made a bet on humanity's fate. What the f This means that Philemon is also responsible for everything that happens. Honestly, I can't imagine who's worse in this scenario. I think Maya is stabbed with the Spear of Destiny. 
which has one of the oldest rumors of inflicting wounds that can never be healed. The gang tries desperately to save her, but it's futile. Maya dies. Thus, the Oracle Maya is fulfilled. Nirolotep laughs as humanity finally destroyed itself and disappears. The kids have lost, but Philemon presents one solution. He can bring back everything and everyone by creating an alternate timeline. But the cost will be them never meeting that summer evening and forgetting the journey they just went through. No one wants to do this, but they don't see any other option. So one by one, the group disappears into the new timeline. Lisa gives us a little good luck before she goes. We are then presented with a choice. <gasps> Philemon says goodbye and we see our friends as they share their final words with each other. You know what? I'm glad we met again. Next time you're gonna join my band, got that? It's a promise. Don't forget. Jinyang, remember me no matter what. I love you. I won't forget. Not my sin, not you, not anyone. We'll meet again, and together we'll save Maya. So, I won't say goodbye, only thank you. We are now back to where we started, but the gang have never met each other, and thus, their lives have changed. Lisa is now pursuing her idle dreams. Akichi is forming his band and is with Miyabi. Jun now has a healthy relationship with his mother and wants to become a teacher like his father. Who's alive now? Towards the end, the group somehow cross paths with each other, thus beginning another journey. When I started this game, my expectations were low, but holy crap was I wrong, because this was a fantastic game! The theme of rumors and facing your past mistakes, the mechanics and gameplay, the lovable and three-dimensional characters, I highly encourage you to play this. Whether it's the PS1, the PSP, or by any other means, play this game. I can see Atlas porting this like they did with the other games. Although I know there'll be some people that won't play it simply because it's old. Which I think is a good reason to remake it. Not to change or fix anything, or add social links and a calendar system, but like Final Fantasy VII where everyone just wanted to see prettier graphics. It could then be fully voice acted, have the modern UI design, and we actually see these characters in 3D. Which kinda happened. Maya and Lisa are being used as test models when Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne was in early development. And just by seeing these PS2 test models, I can't help but imagine Innocent Sin getting that Persona 3 Reload treatment. Either way, I'm glad to see this game still being referenced in the series, and I hope that one day, the remake wishes will come true. 
But until then, I'm happy with the version I have now. Although the story is not over, we still don't know who that drunk guy was, or why King Leo hates us, or why Yulala is a Persona user. But that's a video for another day.